Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, latest webinar, uh, which is Investing in Industry 4.0. Uh, this is an investment webinar that will look at robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence and some really neat ways to get exposure to those emerging themes. My name is Mark Noble, and I'm the Senior Vice President of ETF Strategy at Horizon ETFs. And I'll be moderating today's webinar with Hans Albrecht, who is our Vice President, Portfolio Manager, and Options Strategist at Horizon ETFs. And I think also fair to say our, our resident technology uh, investment expert as well. You know, going into 2018, emerging technology stocks in areas ranging from artificial intelligence to cybersecurity were one of the hottest investment themes out there. At the end of last year, though, we saw certainly a big change occur with a big drop in the momentum in a lot of these technology themes. But the reason they were popular in the first place is because they're part of a seismic technological shift in the world around us, something we refer to as the fourth industrial revolution or quite simply Industry 4.0. Joining us today is uh, Hans Albrecht, uh, who is one of our key ETF uh, investment strategists and has a real passion for technology investing. I think you're in for a real treat today as Hans goes through uh, some of these stocks and some of the stories behind them. And he's going to provide an overview on why Industry 4.0 is very much still on track how it will shape our lives in the coming decades, and why now, particularly more than ever, is an ideal time to make an allocation to this long-term technological megatrend. So before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in our webinar. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. We encourage you to send in your questions at any time, and we will collect these and address them within 24 hours of receiving them if it's not addressed in today's session. Of course, some of you may be listening to a replay, Feel free as well to always send in your, your questions. We will try to get back to you. There's also um, on the uh, pa panel to your uh, left, there's the presentation, a Horizon's product lineup, uh, some you know, collateral that looks at 4 and Arbot, which are the two ETFs that Hans will be discussing today. And you can download them anytime during the presentation. Please also note this call is recorded, so you are free to listen to any content anytime. It also will be available on our website following this presentation. Okay, so just if uh, we go to the next slide here, just a quick uh, overview of what our agenda will be here today. So we're going to talk about what Industry 4.0 and key technologies are. So if you're new to this idea and investment theme, uh, no worries. We're going to quickly go over what it is and why it's important. Uh, then Hans will address the Industry 4.0 uh, Index ETF and talk about some of the key drivers behind that ETF. And then we'll talk about the growth opportunity specifically in one of the areas of Industry 4.0, which is robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, which is also represented by the Horizons Robotics and Automation Index ETF, which has hopefully a memorable ticker for everybody, ARBOT. So uh, Hans Albrecht co-manages one of the largest option books in Canada, about $700 million in covered call ETFs, and he oversees the day-to-day -day options activities. Uh, for Horizons ETFs, uh, along with his partner, Nick Picard, here. Uh, previously, Mr. Albrecht was a floor option market maker and traded a large volatility book for National Bank Financial. He's lectured at McGill University and has appeared in numerous ex expert derivatives panels. He's also uh, a technology in uh, investment expert uh, and is a graduate of the University of Oxford Financial Technology Program, and obviously that's what we're talking about here today. And he has been featured numerous times, uh, probably on a uh, certainly a monthly basis, not a weekly basis, in publications such as Bloomberg, Investment Advisor, The Global Mail, The Financial Post, and he's also a regular on BNN Bloomberg. Hans, always a pleasure to have you with us. How are things today? Fantastic, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone uh, for taking the time out of your day to attend. Um, I personally find the topic uh, very interesting. It not only talks about things uh, that are clearly important to us as investors, uh, we think of earnings and growth and possibly even a dividend here and there, but it also speaks to a larger element of wonder and excitement about how the world is changing in ways that are really transforming how we go about our lives. And from a business perspective, uh, how companies are realizing that if they don't become a part of it, they're risking falling behind uh, or even obsolescence in, in some cases. So uh, now technology has been around for thousands of years. We tend to think of the term as something that describes the present uh, or more recent times. But if you look back in time a little bit, the Chinese had simple robots, the Romans were figuring out how to chop gold into little strands, one one thousandth of the width of a hair, uh, which is really nanotechnology, if you can imagine, uh, 2,000 years ago. Um, 
the Greeks figured out a steam powered turbine, although James Watt, and that's where we get the term wattage, he gets all the credit for the invention 1,600 years later because his timing was right, and timing's everything, as we know as investors. And that helped to spark the Industrial Revolution uh, with the steam engine. So what we're really focusing on today is this incredible recent confluence of several factors in the past decade or so that have been pushing us towards Industry 4.0, and they've lit a fire under the pace of current growth and tech innovation. So number one, unprecedented amounts of data. 90% of existing digital data uh, around the world has been created in the, in the last two to three years. That's an astounding uh, statistic. Number two, the next level of computing capability. So we'll talk about GPUs and learning networks uh, a little bit later. Number three, algorithms uh, that are able to take advantage of all this to create possibilities uh, for new innovation. So all these things are helping to feed what we call Industry 4.0, which we think of as merging the digital with the physical like never before into smart automation robots and the artificial intelligence, so on and so forth. And we see these things happening all around us. When Google fills in your search term, that's AI. When Netflix suggests movies you might like, that's a kind of machine learning. Inflation is being kept in check by a lot of these trends. So from a business perspective, manufacturing savings through automation are happening. Some banks only exist virtually now. So what happens when a bank doesn't have to buy or lease real estate or build branches and pay people to work in them? That ends up as lower cost, which hopefully means lower cost to us as consumers in the end. So technology is really becoming a foundation for our modern way of life and merging the old with the new is a big thing. Cars have been around for a long time. Now they can drive on their own. They can give you these incredible levels of safety uh, due to new hardware and sensors, GPS that can tell you the car in front of the car in front of you has hammered its brakes. That kind of thing is going to save money uh, and lives. Um, it's hard to say enough about mobile. Phones have become almost an extension of our very selves. I mean, think about how far we've come in only about 10 or 12 years since the iPhone came along. They're keeping track of what we're doing, what we're buying, where we're going, how we're feeling, the routes we take, the number of steps we take in a day, everything. We've got these amazing computers in our pockets now, and we're not shy about, uh, about using them. I find that fascinating, Mark, is that so many people are happily contributing to this gargantuan database of information that's be being expanded. Every day when we buy things and post pictures, right. we talk about everything, the music we listen to, the movies we watch. Social media okay. is one of the biggest drivers of data. People don't just think anymore, they've got to write it down. Blogs are big business. Uh, those are being scraped for data. So you're gonna see there's this theme of data, data, data uh, uh, throughout the presentation. YouTube last week showed us their top earner was a seven-year-old kid who made $22 million last year. And what he does is open toys. We're, we love to watch anything on YouTube. We're voyeurs in a sense. And that's valuable information. Companies can customize their ads just as Facebook does uh, so well. And we think of Facebook as being free, uh, but what you may not realize is that you're really just trading a lot of personal data about who you are as a person for these services uh, that Facebook provides. And that's fine to most of us. But they're monetizing that data, which is why their revenue is really so fantastic. So big data is big money, and we invest in a number of those companies uh, in our theme. So um, we're going to move along here. A little bit about the history uh, helps explain uh, why we see things as Industry uh, 4.0 at this next stage. Before the Industrial Revolution, Industry 1.0 uh, you know, so let's say the late 1700s. Most people had rural jobs. Over 99% of the population lived outside of town. So this revolution really brought this tremendous change to the developing world as folks came into cities, uh, tasks became more specialized, uh, there was mechanization. You sort of did one thing over and over, which allowed for this larger scale output of products. Steamships, the railroad boom, that created wider spread and global trade, uh, which is more access to demand uh, and therefore more production. Production It creates this great cycle of growth. The weaving loom and textiles uh, were big business in the U.S. and the U.K., which of course came to a head uh, with the Civil War in the 1860s. 
The next 100 years, Industry 2.0 had this big game changer in the form of electricity. The ability to, pr to produce on assembly lines, uh, automation, uh, working at night with light, uh, or even without humans, this idea of mass production. So Henry Ford gets the credit, uh, gets all the credit for the assembly line. He actually learned that from the slaughterhouses in Chicago as the carcasses sort of made their way along uh, the, propus, uh, the, the process. Um, but suffice to say, he's known for, for coming up with the idea for the assembly line. The Model T, which famously came in any color you wanted as long as it was black, uh, Ford hit, something, hit on something big. The assembly line proved effective at producing things at a lower cost. So the Model T went from almost $1,000 to $280 um, uh, to the consumer, for the consumer. So this concept boosted this idea of the middle class being able to move up to, into society. And this, the, the idea that a growing segment of the population wasn't just making things, uh, but they could also buy more things. So broader. I think, I think you know, to that point, Hans, I mean, when we talk about disruption of technology, you know, we're not just talking about neat things to invest in that have technological application. I, I think what you're highlighting here is that there's huge social and economic change that tends to be spurred by technology. I mean, if we look at this chart here, we can almost make the case that technology kind of precedes the next evolution of our economy because of how impactful it is in reorienting you know, the modes of production and and socioeconomic status and all these other aspects. Absolutely, Mark. And, and to that point, um, you know, uh, you know the, the socioeconomic uh, side of things um, is really, really a, a big factor in growth from this moment forward. Uh, and we really have mobile to thank for it. So, for example, 2.5 billion people in the world are unbanked or underbanked. Uh, that's incredible, right? They, they lack traditional data. They can't get loans. They essentially they don't have a credit history. So there are now new mobile credit assessment methods that have been developed that use social media and app usage and email uh, habits to create these credit scores. So, so you know, in a, in a country like Mexico, for example, 90% of business is ignored by the by the banking system. It's, it's a very uh, it's a very concentrated banking system, much like ours in Canada, and they almost disregard the, a very large segment of the economy. So is that going to make a big difference when suddenly people can, people can get loans and, uh, and, cre and make their dreams come true and, and create this upward mobility that we're talking about? That's going to filter into markets over time. It's going to filter into businesses that are going to grow and need services. Six billion people are going to have a mobile presence uh, by next year. It's just amazing the change that is going to happen in the world that will ultimately filter into listed markets and, and companies' fortunes uh, are going to be absolutely uh, amazing uh, as things go along. So back to uh, Industry 3.0, uh, that was modern electronics, computer processors. From a very simplistic thing, uh, point of view, let's think of how many people were employed at one time just to count things, inventory. So computers freed up those resources for, for better and more productive tasks. The internet came along, things started to really speed up at this stage. So Industry 3.0, a 4.0 rather, is what we're focusing on today. 3.0 made us interconnected. Email, being able to do business with people across the world, uh, starting to buy things online. 4.0 is about taking all of this data and merging it with our physical world to create better things. Healthcare, robotics, smarter smartphones. Uh, AI is a big, big part of that. So a big, big move. Uh, that is uh, that is underway in so industry. So merging the physical with the digital. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So as we move along, these are the thematic pockets that we've identified as being real drivers of 4.0. Big data in the cloud. Um, at one time, there was a lot of over over capacity uh, in that area, but since the data revolution, uh, there's been this big demand for equipment. So a lot of uh, money to be made in that area. Of course, that's just one part of big data. Advanced robotics and AI. So this is an area in which RBOT, RBOT, really focuses. Uh, industrial robots aren't really that new, but what's different now is that they're combining industrial spatial intelligence sensors and robotics uh, with AI. Uh, so what you're getting is intelligent automation. Uh, and then from a retail standpoint, there are robots that do things like look for spills in the aisles at your local Home Depot and they clean them up. And if you don't have a Roomba home vacuum, I, I recommend one. I can never believe how much that thing uh, actually picks up 
even though the folders look just fine, it, it's quite amazing. Uh, augmented reality, you might know uh, the technology from playing Pokemon Go, or your kids might know it. Um, but it's, it, this is also about the way that cutting edge real estate platforms can furnish your home uh, using actual photos, but then superimposing virtual furniture, rugs, artwork uh, on those pictures to make the space look uh, Industrial more design as well, right? It's a big one. I think they're using this for Industrial design. We've got a big yeah. name in there. Nemechek, I think it's called. Um, uh, big big uses, uh, big usage uh, in the AR space. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Cybersecurity, um, one of the most overlooked areas, uh, and uh, Internet of Things, which is basically just a myriad of connected devices making use of this uh, amazing infrastructure. 3D printing, uh, still finding its way a little bit, but being increasingly used in manufacturing and health care. Healthcare. They're actually able to make uh, uh, 3D printed organs and other body parts, and they're able to imprint DNA into them so that the body doesn't reject them. It's just a really fascinating, world-changing stuff. So the Horizons uh, Industry 4.0 uh, FOURs are one ticket solution uh, for exposure to all these uh, five uh, pockets. So the way that these things work is the five pockets work their way into four as a, co as a sort of catch-all for all these areas of innovation. We'll talk about how Arbot focuses more on robotics and automation, but importantly uh, with that artificial intelligence uh, element. So Arbot's really a way to pinpoint your focus into smart automation areas, logistics fulfillment, the stuff, kind of stuff that Amazon does really, really well. It's really interesting you point that out, Hans, because I think, you know, I love how you've segmented this out in five areas, because I think a lot of people, you know, especially the investment media or we see investment strategists on BNN, they're usually talking about one of these areas, right? Or they're talking about AI, or they're talking about cybersecurity. And I think what you've done is, is and what you're seeing here with this one ETF is this is all coming together. It's all working towards the same idea. So this merging the digital and physical is the end goal. And through these different areas, that these are the key subsectors or sub ideas that are working to this overarching theme that's that's reflected in the ETF. Exactly. It's 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 the theme. It isn't so much a specific industry. It's this theme of working towards uh, these incredible themes of of uh, innovation and. Uh, uh, that are that are working through these major categories uh, that we've identified, and you're and you're going to see there there's there's a lot of overlap, and you're going to see that some companies kind of have their fingers in different areas of those different categories. Um, it tends to be an area where you know someone takes the baton, and then someone else comes across comes along with a slightly better mousetrap, and then suddenly that plays into their revenue. So uh, the argument for having a diversified exposure to this area is uh, particularly strong. Uh, in an in an area like tech in general, but very specifically uh, in Industry 4.0, um, four trades on the TSX. Uh, it owns equities from around the world. It tends to be around 70% U.S., some Japan, some Europe, uh, and there are some other uh, minimum trading, uh, minimum capitalization trading thresholds, that kind of thing, uh, that go along with it. So we'll talk a bit of, about some of this constituents. Uh, Alphabet, so our first category, augmented reality. Alphabet's really the leader in so many areas uh, of 4.0, AI, augmented. They sort of have this unparalleled database because of the, how long they've been around as the go-to search and this their sort of ubiquitous nature and everything. Um, so they're, as a result, they're this gold mine for data, for innovations that we, we haven't even heard of yet. The Alphabet will sort of be the go-to uh, for, for massive amounts of data that can play into some of these innovations uh, that are coming along. So if data is the new oil, as we like to say, uh, Google is kind of like this Saudi Arabia of data just sitting on this massive amount of data. So in our view, it's, it, it is a very key holding. Baidu, similarly, the Google of China, uh, big into AR. Uh, in China, they have more cell users, a bit more of, a, of adoption in certain, uh, in, in the area of mobile. They love the concept. Do, uh, companies are doing fun things like embedding digital coupons in real locations. So people kind of run around and, and they look for these things like they're looking for Pokemon and they find the coupons and they use them. So they're having a bit of fun with uh, with that. And I think it's important, obviously, when you look at Baidu and, and Google, you're talking about you know two of the largest tech companies in the world. These are diversified tech companies, but they've taken a leadership in this particular sector because they're probably doing the most R&D in this area. So I think the index methodology has assigned them to this sector just because they are the leaders in that area. 
Exactly, and so uh, so you have to make a call on who yeah. who the leaders are. Uh, but again, they have their they have their this overlap. It's quite amazing. I mean, companies that we know, but Facebook has this incredible. Um, a mapping algorithm where they've mapped up the half of the earth so far. We don't hear about any of that stuff, but these companies, these big data pipeline companies are doing so many things behind the scenes. They have these gargantuan R&D areas that are coming up with amazing things that we haven't even heard of yet. So you can think of these companies as, as being very, very diverse in terms of where they're heading. Uh, but of course, we know, we know about where their leaders, and that's what these funds tend to focus on. Uh, the leaders in in various uh, various pockets. And each of these constituents is equally weighted, so that's why there's no overweight to Google. They're just they'd each be uh, ten stocks in each bucket, and then weighted accordingly with a two percent weight. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. yeah, ten names in each of these categories. We're going to see all these names here uh, in the slide. Track Selectives S O L I N D G D four G for Bloomberg users. Uh, that's the index, and Selective is the fourth largest index provider, pr provider in the world. Uh, there's a management fee of uh, 65 basis points, uh, I believe, and there's a rebalancing, um, and names can be added and removed uh, on occasion uh, in keeping with the theme. So cloud and big data, you said data is the new oil? So some of the big cloud and big data names? Some of the cloud and big data names. So. Um, you know, we've got our own open text in there, Salesforce, another giant uh, data pipeline, uh, Workday, which has sort of come about uh, quite quickly in the last uh, four or five years, um, big aggregators of data, right? You're going to sort of see this theme of, of data being play, put together and chopped up and, and used in, in various ways in keeping with this idea of data being a real driver of uh, of 4.0. Cybersecurity, I think this is an interesting one. It's not really kind of a sexy topic, right? It isn't at the forefront of what people like to talk about. And I think it gets overlooked. But the fact is that the crooks, the bad guys, are usually ahead of the cops. And online crime is, is quite a massive industry. The nature of really everything we're talking about involves rapid change, incorporating new technology into old the existing legacy system, that in itself creates these vulnerabilities. Data breaches and malware attacks are on the rise, and I think uh, that's obviously only going to get worse as things play out. So we'll see over the next decade that cybersecurity is going to be a, a need as basic uh, as electricity. So Booz Allen, one of the big names in there. Um, Fortinet and Palo Alto, this is a great example of 3.0 versus 4.0. You can think of Cisco and Juniper Networks as industry 3.0, but now companies are really upgrading their whole uh, infrastructure to the cloud. Guess who's taking over? Fortinet and Palo Alto are drivers of earnings in this area now, growing earnings at twice the industry pace. So great example of making sure you have exposure to the next iteration uh, of, iter of earnings growth and, and innovation. It's sort of the Wells Fargo of, of cloud-based data protection, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so next on Internet of Things category, so you know that's just the networking of all these devices. It's it's wearables, it's phones, it's it's your Alexa at home. It's there's an Alexa, Alexa microwave now. Uh, Cirrus Logic, for example, makes a small microphone solution for the Amazon Alexa. And so why is that important? Well, to pick up human commands, these things typically need six or seven microphones. And so their application is now open has now opened up a whole new market for. Amazon as these guys help to produce smaller and smaller devices. So lastly, robotics. NVIDIA, just a key holding really behind a, a, a great deal of Industry 4.0. We'll talk a little bit about them uh, later. Xilinx, a, a nice example of how things can really change quickly. Xilinx uh, came up with these programmable chips, uh, very easy to program without having to have these giant program programming IT departments a better mousetrap, right? And suddenly that's driven revenue very, very quickly. Um, they were behind Alibaba's singles day uh, last year. And that and, and and so it simply means faster sales, more sales. That stock's up 50% uh, since Christmas, and we own it. A nice example of needing to own several horses uh, in each race as we do. And, that, and singles day, for those of you who aren't aware, that's actually the largest retail sales day in the world. So take Amazon Prime and factor it by about 10. It's in amazing, terms yeah. Of Asia Consumer Day, yeah, it's incredible. It makes Black Friday look like a garage sale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so next on, so uh, let's talk about Arbot a little specifically now. Arbot's our ETF that focuses more on intelligent robotics and automation. So think of this, uh, this uh, offering as 
more hardware, but with a large dollop of AI, because that's really what's powering the next generation of smart automation. Uh, so according to Miri, a trillion dollar opportunity going forward. Uh, McKinsey says that by 2030, 70% of companies will be using at least one type of AI, and that's from 33% today, and I'd be willing to bet that that's a little bit uh, on the low side. Now, what's driving this growth from a robotic and automation, uh, smart automation perspective? So again, a timeline helps us to see a little bit where things could be heading. It's earlier on, so we can liken this period to the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, where companies like Microsoft, Apple, uh, Sun Microsystems, uh, and Cisco were really building the public internet uh, infrastructure uh, and the digital world in Industry 3.0. Near the end of the last decade, we start to see who the behemoths are that are emerging. So your Amazons, your Netflix, your Google, your Facebooks, um, and of course, Apple's great second coming. Um, so in Industry 4.0, we're getting the next leg of this modern technological revolution uh, that began, de began decades ago. So, you know, 4.0 is here. There's that little word necessity up there in the slide. It's here. It's part of business and life in this century, and companies are going to have to be a part of it or, or, or they're going to they're gonna struggle. I think it's a crucial point, Hans, because I think people think, you know, right now technology, they think the large technology companies. And, and the reason they're the large technology companies are those are the companies that actually, well, it's for all intents and purposes, won the Internet let's say, in terms of understanding right, right. how to use the digital landscape and become sector leaders in that area. So Amazon and retail, Google and advertising, Facebook and social mediation and, and you know, media in general. Um, but, you know, early stage, the real advantage on any of these technological changes is to be investing in the companies building that infrastructure. So, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, we forget at one point in time that, you know, Cisco was the largest company in the world. And we forget, you know, the Microsoft, you know, that's still, a, you know, one of the largest companies in the world. But, you know, at one point in time, you know, that was the key driver to the access to the Internet. So when we're talking about, you know, technology changes, but we're talking about the companies here, where, you know, some of these names are probably not known to investors. But certainly what they're offering is what we think is the building of the infrastructure of this next leg up. So obviously leadership can change, but right now the opportunity set is in buying the builders, not the users, because we're still in the process of building Industry 4.0. Exactly, and I mean, look, no one's saying Fang, no, no one's saying these big companies are going away. We love yeah. Google, we love Baidu, uh, but it's, it's about identifying the next stage of serious growth. Fang stocks are expensive. Some of them have trouble, are having trouble uh, in the current regulatory environment, trust issues, etc. So this is about finding that next iteration of who is going to change the world. And it is changing fast, and it's happening. So it's a matter of figuring out who's going to take advantage of that, and that's what we focus on here. So drivers of growth, uh, we've got aging population. So, I, I mean, I think this is an interesting one. We, we, you hear about this narrative of how robotics are going to steal jobs and replace workers, and it's, it definitely is true to some extent, and particularly, particularly in areas where there are repeatable manual type tasks. But what people don't realize is that there's this heavy demographic effect on the labor force in the developing world, and that's important to us here. So Japan is somewhat of an extreme example, but there just may not be enough workers in a few decades to, uh, uh, to, to do the work. Um, so, you know, aging populations, low birth rates, birth rates these have a lot to do uh, with the, the, the state of, uh, of the labor force and how it's going to look in a few years. So automation becomes less of a choice. It's less of this sort of impending doom, as, pump, as pe some people see it, from a job perspective, as it is a necessary evolution uh, for many industries. So simply put, you've got to have those machines. And in some ways, it's enhancement as well, right? I mean, you know, as we get older, obviously, our physical body breaks down. But I think what, you know, what you're driving at is, you know, the one thing that, you know, tends to stay around is that ticker up in your head. And, you know, a lot of this stuff can actually enhance the lifespan of, of the worker. Um, you know, they're able to actually do more because they're working alongside or augmented by this technology. That's true. And absolutely, even at, even at the at the so-called blue-collar level, and we're going to talk about how it's how it's enhancing and extending careers even for doctors. Um, so labor costs, you know, the jury's out on this one. We've we've seen there's this there's been this uh, technological impact on uh, on the cost of labor. Uh, there's no question that uh, 
you know, automation and things like that are going to um, keep costs low. Uh, you know, you can outsource to, to, to China and areas where the labor is a little bit less expensive, um, but automation really is, is the key to keeping things cheap and really controlling that, that factor. You don't really know where labor costs are going to go uh, in the end. And so these things are starting to, to, to give companies control in the sense of, of some of their costs. The performance improvements. Uh, robot adoption uh, estimated to enhance productivity by 30% uh, by 2025. So, you know, I think we can all agree that this is making this area is making a big difference. Um, which sectors are being disrupted? So quickly, anonymous cars heavily dependent on AI, advanced software, agriculture, maybe one of the most underserved areas where automation can be applied. Uh, a lot of physical tasks. Um, so you can, you know, it could be as simple as having a cart roam around and help people, or it can be, uh, you know, cow milking. Typically, a, the workforce in that area is difficult to manage. There's lots of turnover. As a result, automated milking has become big business. These these things can run 24/7. A cow prefers sleeping, lying down, but it can actually sleep standing up. So the poor cow can be milked all, you know, all day long. Um, robot sensors in the fields. As an example of how farmers typically seed is they just seed the field uh, aggressively, blanketly. This results in some strong and some weak plants. Then they fertilize that area heavily. It helps the strong ones, but it kills a lot of the weak ones. Well, now they have these platforms that can scan the fields and tend to each plant individually for what each plant needs. That's resulting in 10% better yields just from that. Um, Self-driving combines, things like that, I guess, too, right, 24-7. Amazing. That yeah. entire industry is so ripe for uh, for disruption. Uh, the, the, the companies that make uh, those products uh, are really going to thrive um, as uh, as agriculture uh, makes the turn into, into the new century. Manufacturing. In the food industry, $50 billion is lost annually to mistakes. So mislabeling, you know, putting a raspberry yogurt label on a strawberry uh, yogurt. With AI, you get a digital twin that's created, and it has something to compare the product to at all times. So the system knows mismatches right right away, can deal with that. Uh, that's a real game changer in terms of uh, quality control and output. Defense, things like drones, they're going to be replacing soldiers to some extent, saving lives. I think there's obviously, that's a no-brainer. There's a lot of support uh, there. Uh, healthcare, and this one is really, really a big thing. Um, uh, facilitating, complementing what doctors are doing. AI radiology image scanning is already much more effective than what doctors can accomplish. So, so to your point, Mark, we're, th that sort of thing is already reducing doctor burnout. It's freeing them up to do tougher uh, and more important uh, follow-up uh, care type uh, type um, things. And not eliminating doctors, right? I mean, obviously, there's, we all we need more doctors, but. It's, it's not eliminating doctors, it's, it's actually improving their ability to do their job because, again, they can do more and their quality and, and accuracy is improving. We're seeing that in study after study. Exactly, and I think we can agree in Canada that, uh, we, you know, more doctors wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, so, you know, this is going to really, really help uh, in this area. So, um, you know, and from, and from a, you know, an inclusiveness in the indices uh, perspective, um, you know, a lot of these funds are a great way, uh, or these two funds in particular, are a great way, for, particularly for Canadians, to get exposure to stocks in that smart robotic area. A lot of names are just underrepresented in the broader indices, and, and that's, that's definitely true for, uh, for the Canadian indices. Okay, so uh, deep neural uh, learning. Uh, Basically, I mean, we could go on, we could do webinars on, on uh, in this area alone, but, you know, a basic, uh, a basic sort of example of, would be like an AI flashlight that, um, you know, it, machine, a machine learning version of that would be a flashlight that learns the word dark. Every time somebody says dark, it turns on. Deep learning is, is, is learning on a different level. It's actually, these products are learning to learn from themselves. And so, you know, the example of flashlight would be, oh, you know, uh, you know, it's 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 not bright enough in here. So we turn the flashlight on. It starts to learn what the phrases are that are going to uh, that are going to turn that flashlight on. So it's a very it's a much deeper level of understanding and learning uh, that's being uh, uh, that's making its way into AI. So I've done a, a great uh, blog. I 
Hope Great blog uh, recently that's on our website that talks about the differences and it talks about um, Kasparov's loss to to, uh, uh, to IBM's computer in '97 and then about AlphaGo. Very very big different different uh, differences in philosophies on how AI used to be uh, versus uh, today. So I encourage you to go and uh, check that out. Again, here's a beautiful uh, wood grain Atari that uh, I loved so much as a kid. Um, Google's deep learning in 2015 really took it took it to the next stage when it learned to play 49 Atari games. This thing had never even been given the rule, so think about that. Um, it figured out how to how to win a lot of games and how to, to at least do better than the professional human benchmark uh, by essentially learning to learn. So learning to learn is is a really key concept. Um, the cat or dog. So, you know, there was this, I'll just mention this one study, there was this ImageNet challenge, uh, a good example of visual AI. So, you know, they were giving uh, computers thousands of images uh, and asking them to make categorization uh, choices. So, you know, determining the difference between this and that. Humans tend to make uh, mistakes about 5% of the time. When they started this contest in 2010, the computers were making about mistakes about 28% of the time. By 2012, when deep learning came along, the computers were making mistakes 16% of the time. By 2015, they were doing as well as humans, and now they're doing better than humans versus that human benchmark of 5% error. So this kind of success to me is science fiction uh, becoming a reality. Machines replacing tasks is great, it's important, but machines improving upon what we can accomplish is a real game changer. Well, I think, and Hopkins, on that point, I think, you know, with people, with the AI, right, that one thing that they don't, realize that it's using sort of a human design brain process, uh, as far as my understanding goes. So it's it's thinking the way a human would, but its recall is of everything. So, uh, you know, it's hard to put your mind in the mind of an AI, obviously, but the idea is that it can see everything that it's ever seen all at once, right? So, it, you know, it, I'd probably throw myself out the window if I could recall everything I've ever seen, but you put that in, <laughs> you put that in, a, in a machine, yeah. I think it's incredible. I, I, I just... It blows me away that you know there's basically no way to fool it in terms of a cat and a dog, uh, even though it sounds simple. You know, it's looking at 10,000 as you pointed in that slide, 10,000 pictures of cats and dogs simultaneously looking at them all at once uh, yeah. to make its distinction. Right? Amazing, and and, the, and really, what's amazing is the visual aspect. And uh, they're actually having AI uh, deep learning AI agents watch screens and they're trying to figure out how a baby actually learns. So these these computers are watching blocks being piled and falling down and things like that. They're literally trying to figure out how a baby forms its basic foundation for how it how it looks at things. Uh, the 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 advancements in this area are l quite literally mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, and we really have the GPU to thank for that. Nvidia kind of pioneered this great product. Uh, an unbelievable company. In 2009, the CEO made this amazing decision to really focus on this. So think of a GPU as the next better version of a CPU, in a sense. CPUs are very, very fast, but a GPU can run hundreds of parallel, thousands of parallel tasks uh, at once. So it's it's much more efficient at visual type things. And, and people have always figured that vision, being able to see things, being able to, 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 to process things visually is, is necessary for us to really think of computers as being intelligent. And that moment has finally come. So the GPU has really changed everything um, for us. It's like Frank's Red Hot, right? It's in everything. It's in everything. <laughs> it literally is. Well, well, the GPU, they're at the forefront of driverless cars, CGI, scientific discovery, uh, every form of AI. They're, they're working with CPUs right now. AlphaGo, the system that beat the, the second best player in the world at Go, has a combination of hundreds and hundreds of GPUs working with some CPUs. But the new versions of GPUs are actually uh, working without CPUs at all. They're starting to incorporate a lot of the, the abilities that a CPU has. So things are going to get really, really impressive at some point too uh, in, this, in the GPU area very, very soon. So uh, our robotics uh, top 10 holdings, we talk about... Um, uh, it seeks to replicate to the extent possible the INDXX. So a little bit different, um, a little bit different index from the selective one. Uh, looks at the global robotics and artificial intelligence thematic index. Uh, management fee of 68 basis points. Um, it is uh, our one-ticket solution to robotics and AI. 
AI. So within the, the overall story uh, of 4.0. A little bit different, not equal weighted. You can have seven, eight, ten names uh, that have a little bit heavier weighting, uh, and those happen to be in sensor names, robot names, uh, NVIDIA, Intuitive Surgical, which we'll talk about momentarily. So a little bit of a different philosophy there, uh, heavier weight and some of the real leaders in robotics, really the physical uh, that we're talking about. So a little bit of an objective uh, change and the investment objective change last year. Uh, we went from following the Robo Global uh, Robotics and Automation Index to the Index Global Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Thematic Index. Mark, what would that? that would I mean, immediately, more. I think it's the same exposure. I think what we saw is that, you know, as you highlighted with a company like NVIDIA, um, you know, large companies tend to be dominating the space and creating sort of moats around their businesses. So, and you're seeing investor dollars chase these pure play companies. So what we did was effectively, you know, reduce the number of holdings substantially by following this index and really capturing the pure play companies, which seem to be the companies that are, that the dollars are chasing. And of course, the index has the flexibility to add more names as more pure play companies come in there. But I think it, you know, the performance and the objective is effectively the same. Um, less names, but bigger names and more concentrated in this robotics area. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. So the top top 10 holdings right there, if you want to take a look, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of robots, sensors, um, NVIDIA, the heart of it all, uh, the heart of many things, um, Intuitive Surgical. Uh, NVIDIA, just a, just a really amazing company, as I said, pioneered the GPU. Uh, come back a little bit this year, uh, or at the end of last year, and I like that. I like that it's it's now on sale. A um, little bit of a misstep there with some of the uh, the um, cryptocurrency uh, chips that are, they aren't selling as many of, but they are really at the heart of everything going forward, uh, and I think uh, well positioned at this point. Sensors. These are the eyes and ears uh, of our robots, of our automated, of our automation. Uh, Kyance is one of the leaders in that area. Um, Intuitive Surgical, amazing story there. These are these are uh, these are uh, assisted devices, robot assisted medical devices. You can perform procedures from remote locations. And one of the most amazing things is, imagine that a doctor at, at an advanced age. Imagine the wealth of knowledge that somebody might have. But let's say you know he or she isn't quite as steady as. Uh, as he used to be. No longer a problem. This technology filters it out. It's almost like this auto-tune for surgeons uh, corrects those small imperfections. So again, that thing we talked about earlier, uh, extending the careers uh, for people uh, and being able to continue to use that wonderful knowledge uh, that people have. Robots and Logistics, uh, our own little uh, company here in uh, Toronto, Yaskawa, leading company in a lot of ways, although they have branches around the world. Daifuku, uh, logistics, uh, very much into uh, creating, uh, you know, warehouses and uh, things that Amazon does very, very well to perfection, in fact. Uh, these guys are involved in... Uh, roller ABD. systems, right? Just, I mean, smart roller systems. Sounds boring, but... It you is. You know, like think of airport security, I think they have something like 70% of the market share of those of global airports. <laughs> right, and that means that is efficiency, right? You are trying, you're trying to create efficiencies, you're trying to create less errors, and uh, there's no better way to do that than, uh, than uh, you know, smart and intelligent automation. Uh, and ABB in Switzerland, one of the biggest companies, been around for over a century. Uh, they're big in Europe uh, and around the world. Um, so. We've got the performance here. Uh, you know, definitely Arbot has a solid beta to the broader market. It tends to move uh, a little bit more uh, at certain times when the market's coming off a little more. It does well when the market's going up. There's no question uh, that all the China rhetoric, the tariff and trade war um, uh, stuff has, has had an effect on uh, tech in general, as we know, last year. Um, but the, the product has come back very, very strongly. Uh, this year as well. It's probably important for people to know on the on the line that 60% of the companies in this index are not in the United States. Obviously, Nasdaq are U.S. listed stocks, and, and you know, huge discount uh, trading uh, in terms of Asian companies last year. That despite earnings growth, as I think you're addressing here, but they're still, you know, they they traded at less because they're so oriented to the Asian economy, which got absolutely pummeled last year in terms of those equity markets. So, you know, important to understand the big difference between probably the NASDAQ and bots is that NASDAQ is 100% U.S. listings, where only 40% of bots would be in, in the U.S. 
Good. Yeah, good point, Mark. Good point. And I mean, you know, it, it, investing in technology is about looking for these solid uh, stories and, and themes. And so markets are going to go up and down. But I think no matter uh, no matter what's going on, areas like AI, automation, big data, the cloud, uh, these are strengthening trends. So, you know, Apple announced large job cuts, but none in AI. Alibaba warned on earnings. Uh, but it says con it continues to invest heavily in cloud and computing and AI. So that's what it's all about, uh, I think, investing in trends with staying power and momentum and choosing a good diversified approach um, is, is particularly important uh, in this theme. So um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation um, and it's given you a good overall view of, uh, of tech and of Industry 4.0 in particular. Perfect. You know, we're going to just give a minute for uh, questions to come in. I'm going to, I'm going to start with a question of my own while we just wait for questions to come in from the listeners and on the, on the line. Um, you know, I think the key one here, and I think we've hit at it, but I think it's probably worth really addressing again, is you know, why wouldn't you just buy the FANG stocks, right? Because obviously, they're the omnipresent stocks. And we're, we've listed here probably 80 different stock options in two different ETFs uh, that give you broad exposure. Um, you know, as someone who really follows this space, Hans, I mean, where's the where's where's the benefit of the Fang, and where's the benefit of this approach, uh, this diversified emerging tech theme approach, and, and is it a case of owning both? I, I think it's I think it's a case of owning. Uh, there are good names in Fang, so I think I think the big thing about Fang is it's pretty developed at this point. Having said that, there is there is room for growth. You can't ignore a, a company like Google, for example. They're behind. They're the fuel behind a lot of 4.0. Uh, big in security, clouds, you know, and in you know, in an autonomous driving, that kind of thing, uh, with Waymo. Um, you know, generally speaking, these stocks are kind of the real winners of 3.0. So, you know, our idea is to position for the next wave uh, of revolution that's in 4.0. You know, Facebook's kind of dealing with trust issues, regular regulatory government scrutiny, that kind of thing, and frankly, user saturation. Um, what are the other ones? Netflix may be okay, could be very volatile. Um, I think the idea is that, as in my example earlier, Cisco and Juniper were 3.0 in uh, in um, security. Palo Alto and Fortinet are 4.0. So when you're really looking for these companies with explosive growth in creating this uh, new infrastructure and taking advantage of, of the sort of modern movement uh, of industry 4.0, I think that's a uh, that's a good a way to focus on these ETFs as as the sort of future. Are Fang stocks going away? Probably not, but um, I see them as sort of quite uh, highly priced at this stage and having some problems, particularly two or three of them. So I like to look at uh, 4.0 as a sort of different category of, of stocks. I, I mean, I mean, technology changes too. If you go back to 2000 and you know 2003, you know, did you own Rim at the time, this is BlackBerry now, or did you own Palm Pilot, did you own Apple? And I think the smartest people on the street probably had diversified opinions, and those all would have been good picks. But of course, only one ended up being the, the, the leading stock there, right? There. I mean, BlackBerry's obviously, we could say we will, but if Apple's the one that took over right. that market, you know, I, I guess I, I, we could say the same thing, I guess, what you're driving at here is it's, we don't know who the next things are, but they're probably coming out of this basket of of leaders, or maybe they're not, but at least these index ETF solutions have the ability to bring those stocks on. Right, and the the, the growth money has been made in a, in a in a company like Apple that is that is now transitioning to being a service com for services company, a kind of a, a utility company of sorts. We don't know what the future holds, but think of as some of those stocks as having had their big growth uh, moves in growth, and so we look we we're looking at this next iteration. And uh, we're still, I'm just going to grab a couple more questions here from the group. I remember, again, if you have a question, you can just put it into the uh, text box on your right. Um, you know, we've discussed 4 and RBOT. Now, 4 offers the broad exposure to all the different buckets of 4.0. But in terms of specifically to robotics, uh, why would you look at RBOT right now? I mean, that's one of the sub-themes that seems to be really driving performance right now. And I'm curious on your thoughts on just specifically robotics relative to 4. Yeah, I mean, we tend to think of uh, as sort of Teslas and the Amazon Alexa as, as as smart, but really there's this giant smart industrial revolution happening. So, 
you know, to some of my points earlier, warehousing applications, those are one of the biggest trends for this year. So e-commerce is this nonstop uh, sort of growth juggernaut. So things like fulfillment are big adopters of autonomous robots. So these companies are making a lot of money already. They're involved in a, in a strong trend right now. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't pie in the sky stuff. It's happening and it's big. Um, you know, Amazon kind of started it all with this supremely efficient ful fulfillment center uh, idea. And so with robot, with Arbot, you're buying into this sort of relentless modernization movement uh, that's happening around the world in factories and warehouses and sensors and smart uh, automation. So it's like, I almost think of it as this big upgrade cycle and Arbot is really sitting at the core uh, of that movement. And then we have a question just on, on earnings. I know last slide we, we talked about that, but I mean, the, the point of this is that, you know, despite what happened to some of the valuations last year, earnings still continues to remain strong in this area, uh, which would mean would suggest that's probably an interesting entry point. Would that be accurate, Hans? Absolutely, and I love it when stocks go on sale, when stocks that I love uh, go on sale. And look, we've got some intuitive surgical is, is pushing to break out to all-time highs, and that's because they're doing fantastic, regardless of what's going on uh, in China uh, uh, or, uh, or other areas of the world. This, the, there are some trends that are simply unstoppable, in a sense. Uh, and then you've got other names that have pulled back, and they're fantastic names, but they've run into a hiccup because of um, cryptocurrency issues. But make no mistake, these are, these are the companies that are building uh, 4.0. So, and their earnings per share, is, it's not declining. I mean, it continues to kind of stay steady or go up. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of them have sort of mentioned that things might soften in certain areas, but that's the great thing is they sort of have their, their, their paws in so many different areas of growth here that when one isn't doing as well, um, you know, augmented reality is picking up the slack. AI is picking up the slack. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Great, great place to be in my and opinion. Then, Final question here because we are running out of time, but it sort of segues from what you were mentioning. So Asia is important as well. I think if the Asia discount that we saw uh, comes off, I mean, that could be another tailwind, right? If, if Asia comes back online, that could uh, really help some of these technology stocks. It could. And I, and I think Asia is, regardless of, 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 uh, of growth concerns, and, and the growth is still pretty darn good over there uh, overall, but I'd say, you know, it's such a hotbed for technology. You know, they don't have these old lumbering legacy system. So innovation is really what it's all about over there. They're sort of making this big push into AI. So, you know, Western companies are working very, very hard to grab that market share and hold market share over there. Um, and, you know, for sure, there could be some uncertainty over there, but the, the, the tech juggernaut is moving ahead just fine over there. And, and I think, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see that in the numbers uh, throughout the year. All right, well, that's probably the fastest 55 minutes I think we've ever done on this webinar. I think I could listen to another hour, uh, honestly. That was, that was fun. Uh, but, you know, thank you, Hans, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Again, if you have questions, we haven't uh, skipped over you. We will try to get to you in the next hour, uh, 24 hours. Um, and, you know, anytime, really, you can reach us at the contact number that's up on your screen right now. We'd love to talk about some of these themes with you. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would really appreciate it if you could complete it and uh, provide your feedback. You also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. If you liked what you heard, please share it with your friends, colleagues, grandmas, aunts, uncles, if they want to know, you know, what is it with those crazy uh, technology stocks. Hopefully, we've given you a little bit of a sense of what's happening there. So, on behalf of Horizon BTS and our presenters, Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day and good luck on the rest of your investment journey. Thanks everyone.